Uh, you know, everybody is using internet to uh, to make statistics, to try to understand the world. Mm -hmm. And uh, mostly these data are used to uh, help the finance world uh, to, um, let's say, to make more money, to understand how to uh, create new markets, how to explore the possibility to make more, more money. So uh, I was really excited by the fact that we could have data about something that is very human something that is not quantified usually, mm -hmm. like emotions of the world, emotion of people, emotion of the bigger cities, and so on. Another point that is very important is that I consider that internet has become the world nervous system. Mm -hmm. So everybody becomes a nerve's end ending. And so we can have a feeling of what the planet is actually feeling and uh, to uh, we get feedback from uh, seven billion people that tell us uh, how people feel in different places around the world so I'm interested by this that aspect as well but as you you understood that uh, this doesn't try to be a real scientific tool it's more an attempt to say that uh, in a symbolic way we can consider that to take uh, into account the human factor is something that should be the priority. Uh, you know, I want people to start thinking that something is happening and technology is not there to neutralize only people. And maybe to feel that there is something happening, <clears throat> there is something that should lead us to uh, understand better, uh, better the world. So, of course you can expect Emotion Forecast to tell you what will be the feelings of the world tomorrow and the day after tomorrow. Of course, the probability that you really get something that works is pretty low. Uh, also, because what Emotion Forecast analyze, Forecast analyze it's not the real emotions of the world. It's the emotions of the world, of the world filtered by the internet. English language, connected people, and it's only a certain part of the world. And the interesting thing in the series of work, uh, Mechanics of Emotion, is if you look carefully to some of the maps, that comes from this, uh, this work, you see that some continents, some parts of the world are completely invisible. They don't exist, like missing limbs. It doesn't mean they don't feel, it just means that the, the, the web reflects nothing about what's happening there. So, in your, in your manifesto, Art After Technology, um, you express a sort of like a proce processual understanding of new media art as a work in progress. So how is the symbolic value of emotion forecasts and, and uh, Occupy Wall screens um, being altered from being exhibited here in New York in addition to being exhibited in Europe or in cyberspace? <laughs> uh, you know, emotion forecast, forecast could exist everywhere. It's something for the net. And it's very good if you uh, provide this information widely, and it's, so it's good to have it on a screen uh, that is on the walls. Occupy wall screens is different. For me, it's very important for a media work to be context uh, specific and to uh, take into account where it is placed. So I really thought about this work, thinking about New York. Uh, so for me, it's a, the beginning of something, of a kind of action that can be an extension of the actual Occupy Wall Street movement. Uh, and I would like people to think more and more how to occupy not only wall screens, but I would say the media globally. Uh, because this is a place to be when you want something to be heard by everybody. In a way, Occupy Wall Street has, um, has sort of like a seed or a home in New York. 
this is where this is like the origin of the idea maybe. exactly yeah I was I was really thinking about what kind of emotion for me makes sense now and uh, I've been really impressed by this movement uh, by the fact the movement is not coming from a party, is not coming from an existing political group, just coming from the fact that people cannot stand anymore a situation that becomes quite absurd. And the fact this is starting from New York, from Wall Street, from a district where people uh, have been defending a certain vision of the world, uh, dominated mostly by money, uh, I think this is uh, so strong and I, I hope the movement will take other shapes now and uh, you know it's for me it was not possible to make a bigger symbol that to decide to start in Wall Street for that for that movement and I, I don't think that the impact in Europe is as big as it should be and so I think if it's possible to occupy screens so all over the world then uh, it will be uh, it will be meaningful as well, and I hope artists will uh, participate more and more in creating actions, events, and uh, maybe new kind of symbols to make the thing stronger in the mind of people. Yeah. So Occupy Wall screens is um, is is in a way also intended to to help the movement, help it to progress, or help it to grow in people's minds. It's definitely uh, a way to give another hint to understand uh, the movement and what's going on. And as I've been talking about uh, quantifying the emotions, and on the other hand, the same way that the stock exchange and the stock market, to put them together in one work where we had them face to face, uh, for me, it's uh, also the key of the whole series of work, Mechanics of Emotion. And this is for me, this is my way to support the movement and to uh, maybe to open new, uh, new tracks and uh, new possibilities of uh, development. Can you give examples of what you intend the public to experience in other works of yours, such as um, Tunnel Under the Atlantic? Um, you know, I'm trying to create situations. I'm trying, to, I'm trying to have people in a certain situation where they are committed to react and to, um, uh, to act in a way that helps them to think about what they are doing. In the tunnel under the Atlantic, for example, they were, in 95, they were actually digging in order to meet the people on the other side of the Atlantic. And it took to them five days before seeing the face of the other. And for me, it was very important. The statement was, there were many statements, but one was about the fact to consider that even if technology allows you to do something in real time, to see people in real time about the world, maybe it's stronger if you take five days. Uh, and the intensity of the emotion at this time uh, the impact of the work was much bigger because of this delay. And people used to come one or two hours a day and to come the day after and the day after. And um, that, was really, that was really amazing because people are not used to come many days to see the same work because it was not to see the work. It was to meet people, to experience something that is a kind of collective experience and to enjoy the fact to be in touch with somebody they don't know. That is very often what people do on the internet as well. Is that related to, um, to when you speak about the architecture of uh, communication? Is that related? Yeah, because I, I think technology allows communication, allows the possibility people to be in touch, to uh, see the image, to hear the sound. Now we have to shape the communication. We have to give it a shape. We have maybe to create a kind of architecture, a kind of a scenario, where this communication goes to another level. 
if you see in the, the internet, people are trying to be in touch with so many people they don't know. The only thing they want is to know that all these people know they exist. It's a, a kind of magi magic mirror. But it's possible also to build the architecture like uh, the real architecture where we evolve in and we meet sometimes people, sometimes not. We have a quality of life inside that is specific. And for this uh, situation of communication, I, I think it's possible to work on this and create a very specific scenario. I think mostly technologies now are created to create, to be a shortcut between the concept, the idea, and the scene. Uh, what we dream of uh, is supposed to be partly possible now, thanks to technologies. And so I think that technologies could help us to um, uh, see the world maybe in a more creative way and also in a more critical way. And this is why I talk uh, about critical fusion. Yeah, I've, been, I've been working a lot on immersion. That means to introduce the real people inside the virtual world, inside the fiction. Reality inside fiction. And I consider now that if we want to change the world, it's better to introduce, to introduce fiction inside reality. That is the exact opposite. And this is to introduce fiction inside reality is uh, could create what the situation is called society of the spectacle. But I think it's possible to introduce fiction inside reality to make reality understandable. This is what I call critical fusion. Fusion of fiction and reality in a way that makes it visible, makes it understandable. So it's not anymore society of the spectacle, it is a spectacle of the society. And that's what you do in your artwork. And this is what I try to do in my artwork. Creating things that looks, for example, like uh, business and, uh, and economics, like, uh, like emotion forecast. And I, 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 I did present it as a, uh, in a performance as a real business market with a big potential. And at the same time, I'm talking about something that is quite the opposite. And this is what I call critical fusion. When you think that there are people that consider the world is made of uh, people thinking in terms of B2B or B2C, business to business and business to consumer, what if something else in the world would exist? So I thought about the necessity to create an H2H, -H, human to human. Whatever we do, it's done by human, conceived by human, for human, anyway. And when we don't think about that point that looks very obvious, we create useless products, innovation, useless innovation, just because we just think about new markets and not about n something new to bring to the humankind. And uh, so the, this is why I created the H2H lab. This is a place where we are talking about human mediations and something to help people to communicate in a way, in any kind of way. And uh, also considering that art is a forefront, is the avant-garde of human mediations. So this is why H2H, H2H is probably a good way to make people understand that art has a role to play in this direction. How do you consider the role of the contemporary artist and how is that different from his role throughout history? Yeah, that's always a difficult question. Uh, for me, there is something in common uh, with what happened before. We are not only exploring the medium. Uh, the artist is not always depending on uh, the uh, sponsors or 
on uh, the church, so they can uh, they can think about a new mission that is not to transmit religion or to uh, try to uh, uh, magnify the image of a uh, uh, sponsor. And so it's probably more about helping people to understand the world. For me, it's a big mission, but it, somebody has to do it. And to understand in a very different way, because of course science, for example, economy in another way, politics, help to understand the world. But sometimes the artist can bring ways that are just stronger because they create the evidence of uh, what's happening. I was thinking about what, um, yeah, I guess what inspires you to create your artwork in the context of, the, of, of how the art world works. It relates to the contemporary artist. Yeah, uh, you know, I really come from uh, contemporary art in a way. And what I do, what I've been doing for the last 20 years, is probably pretty far away uh, from what people consider as contemporary art. Not because the intention is different, but because the means I'm using are different. I'm really transposing my experience of contemporary art and the history of art to new means sometimes, and sometimes also to avoid them. Because we don't need technology all the time, we just need not to reject it for uh, what it is or for what it is not. So, it's a, you know, there, there are people asking me what artists inspired me and so on, and I cannot answer this question because for me, it's an all art history, but the history of science as well, history of politics, literature, philosophy, are a part of the inspiration. We just have to be a kind of filter, a kind of a sponge maybe, and absorb a everything that make, uh, that make the, the world the, how it is, and maybe to try to make it visible, to give another kind of transparency. Okay, got it. So we're at Sakadi Park. What do you think should the message of the pro of the protesters be, and to whom should it be addressed? I think for me, uh, this uh, this movement is such a strong thing in a way that, uh, for the first time, so many people decided to act without. Uh, any political guidance be behind that and uh, just uh, uh, because we reached a point in history where the dominant people are just trying 
to fool everybody. And, uh, and I think the way this movement spread around the world, uh, it's uh, uh, the, the evidence that this is something totally legitimate uh, that should be followed in different ways. So, of course, the question is how uh, this movement can have uh, more than a symbolic impact. How can he really change the world in a way? So I guess there are things that, are, uh, that will allow to go below, uh, I would say below zero, but I don't know in Fahrenheit. <laughs> I mean, uh, it's time to use the tools that people use to uh, have a big impact. And media are very important. This is why I thought it would be interesting to go from the street to the, to the screen. So, uh, and then to start not only to occupy the walls in the city, but also to, um, uh, to occupy the media globally and to uh, make people think that there is a strong, uh, a strong group of people that really want to change the world in a way. And, it's time. <laughs> yeah, so the question is what to occupy, where to occupy, how to occupy, and what for? What kind of uh, impact we want on the world? What kind of change uh, is really needed now? And I guess uh, it's possible to build now the next step that will be uh, ways to maybe to occupy the stock market maybe to occupy the financial uh, business globally. But there are probably ways to do that. And it will be more and more people that will uh, be ready to be part of it. Hello, brother. How are you doing, sir? Nice to meet you, Make Happy New Year. Hello. Hello, brother. Nice to meet you. Happy New Year. Will you describe your work as post-digital art? I guess so. I guess so. I'm very interested by the question of uh, what will become art after technology. Um, I think the digital uh, era has created a, a, big, uh, a big change. It's kind of tsunami that has absorbed every domain of activity, every field. And now we just, we are open. We uh, can use all the means available in a very open way. We are, even the frame is open. We are not obliged to stay in a frame. We are not obliged to stay in a screen. We can invade the city, invade the real world, act uh, in the skin, in the biology, act uh, on uh, any kind of material that is reachable, accessible, plastic, that means they take shapes. And this is what I call open media art. I think artists should use open media. And, uh, and this is what I try to do in my work, not to make the demonstration that uh, it's uh, possible, uh, just uh, to use it and to enjoy this freedom. To, uh, to be able to talk about the world, to talk about what's happening to everybody, and uh, by using everything, including the real life. The future is, is, as we can predict it, is something coming from the present. So it's everything. Uh, we can, uh, of course, one of the most obvious things of post-digital art is the denial of digital. It's the fact to, to do uh, low-tech projects. And, uh, and this is one of the trends that will be followed. Uh, and we have to take it into account because we will be completely overwhelmed by uh, uh, all uh, messages, data, information, and so on. And we just want to free ourselves from that. So artists will probably have to fight against as well. And some other fields are probably all the fields that take into account the fact that uh, uh, it's possible now to act on the real life, to change the life, 
to uh, create new scenarios for life, to avoid scenarios, to fight against scenarios, uh, to uh, create new ways of surveillance, to avoid surveillance, to work, as uh, some people say, su on surveillance. And everything will be like that, exploring what is possible and exploring the potential and the dangers of the possibilities. And in relation to that, what is the future of the museum? Yeah, the, the museum is a recent invention, you know. It has maybe something like uh, 200 cent two centuries or something like that. So, um, so the future of museum will be probably not a museum. It doesn't mean that a museum won't exist. They would exist to talk about what has been done, done before. They would exist in order to create the documentation about what is done. But now we are more and more in forms of art that are made of streams, that, that are dynamic forms that are not uh, finished, achieved objects that could be supposed yeah, to uh, yeah, reach perfection that. in a way. Like, there will be processes. Uh, there, there will be impermanent evolutions. And the quality of the evolutions, the quality of the process, will be uh, the demonstration of the excellence of the work. So what kind of museum? supposed to be traditionally static. Uh, for me it's like a, something mineral. What can, can it make with something organic? Art is becoming rhizomatic, rhizomatic organic and uh, uh, we have to face this big change. Museum exhibits artwork that resonates across cultures and across cultural differences. What do you think would be the characteristics or the sort of the successful characteristics of such artworks that could work across cultural differences and sort of combine and connect different cultures? Uh, for me, uh, to be a real successful work should be streaming and not in terms of te video technology, but uh, in, in terms of dynamic, something that would not be uh, fixed content, something that would change according to the place, would change according to the time. <laughs> and uh, uh, so we would experience the evolution of the content according to uh, where it's, uh, the screen is located. And uh, so this is, uh, for me, the important is uh, the impact of the context on, on the work and the impact of the work on the context. And uh, this is for me the strongest thing. The, either the project is involving uh, the world or something deeply inside us that it could be considered as kind of universal or uh, this is something that is uh, time and space uh, uh, sensitive, that is uh, really related to what's going on. And I'm sure it's possible to conceive worlds that make more sense wherever they are uh, displayed or presented. But I really think that considering that opening windows on uh, the city walls is uh, probably uh, 
Yeah, part of the future of museum. So the future of museum is not a museum. It's something maybe outside, it's something that becomes part of our life. And that's what everybody expects. It's not to dissolve art, it's to make art stronger because it's everywhere.